Good morning, sunshine. Today is day seven of our mission to cross the Pacific Ocean from Mexico all the way to French Polynesia. We are 800 miles into this trip and we've got another two weeks to go. Today, I think it's time I introduce you to the eight people that I'm trapped on this boat with for three weeks. The crew, the first coffee. The eight people aboard Parlay have gotta be one of the most diverse that have crossed the Pacific together. We've got a Kiwi, Aussie, and Geelan, two Canadians, two Americans, and a Chinese guy. So today's video is gonna be a bit slower paced, more like a podcast, so we can actually get to know everyone on board. Ah, so this mission to cross the Pacific Ocean to French Polynesia to see where Dwayne the Rock Johnson was born all stems from this man's dream. He was born there? For the purposes of this video, he was born there. Do you that? He's got the tattoo on the side, the Polynesian Samoan. tattoo. He's Samoan. You're ruining my video. I have thus far told the audience that when you were a wee lad in the hills of Scotland, you dreamed of crossing the Pacific Ocean on your own boat. From Scotland. <laughs> I worked on super yachts for 15 years, traveled extensively around the world via the ocean, but on someone else's yacht. For the last 15 years, I've wanted to do it on my own boat. And now we're doing it. It's a dream come true. So the last time he tried this, days before leaving, they were struck by lightning. And he had to scrap everything, do a ton of repairs, and that was two years ago. COVID happened, bulkheads broke, got struck by lightning twice. It was rough. I mean, he basically rebuilt this whole boat. All right, he added a foot and a half to the back sugar scoops. He built this massive hard top. And then the universe tried to stop us again. We're about, literally about to leave, go up the rig and find crack in the rigging that holds the mast up. So that delayed us another two, three weeks trying to get that sorted. It's like everything was trying to tell us not to do this. So I hope we're doing the right thing. <laughs> we're doing the right thing. Before I even knew this guy, I was watching him talk about how he wanted to bring this hurricane damaged boat across the Pacific and circumnavigate. So when was the first time you ever thought about crossing? In 2013, I was on a super yacht in Thailand. It was a 50 meter yacht. And the owner bought a Lagoon 450, brand new, straight out of the packet. And he made me the captain of that boat. It was a four cabin layout. I was skippering that around Thailand and I said, this is my dream boat. It was perfect. I wanted to do surf charters. I wanted to have a bunch of crew around. I wanted to sail the world. I said, this is the boat to do it on. That was in 2013 on a brand new 2013 Lagoon 450. Then Hurricane Irma happened. I was looking at 20, 30 hurricane damaged boats and this boat popped up. It's a 2012 four cabin Lagoon 450 and it was fucked. And I said to my friend who was there, I said, this is the boat. And he looked at me like I was nuts. So that's five years ago. December 2017, just over five years. So 10 years ago, this comes out, it's eight years, eight years, years ago. <laughs> I'm slow at editing, but not this time. 10 years ago, you caught the bug when you knew. Six years ago, you started to make it happen. We fixed the boat, sailed, fixed the boat some more, sailed. We put 20,000 miles on Parlay before we started this trip. Oh. Uh, I won't exaggerate, it's probably 15,000 miles. We went all the way down to Grenada from the BVIs and then went across to like Venezuela and stuff, went down to Colombia, then all the way back up to Guatemala, then kept on going north to Mexico, Cayman Islands, all the way back down to Panama, and then from the Panama through the canal and then all the way up to Mexico on the Pacific side. It hasn't been like all work getting the boat ready for this. We've been doing this for five and a half years. This is just the biggest adventure of our lives. It's so crazy to think that Colin's dream from over a decade ago, I'm coming for you, Katie, is what brought all of us here in one way or another. Wanna take over as head chef and I'll do the first? Oh, no, 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 Katie. You today are head chef. This is Katie. Katie, as you guys know, is my arch nemesis. <laughs> she filmed me making my one mistake that I've ever made. I wasn't even sleeping, I was just getting a little shut eye. You know the same part watching the damage. <laughs> And then she told on me, Nart. Here we go again. You're the chef today and you're going to tell us your story. I want to know everything about Katie. I'm from West Philadelphia. On a playground is where I spent most of my day. She's a Nart and she likes Will Smith. Got it. Chorizo is so greasy. I love chorizo so much. Really? How do you guys feel about chorizo? First bacon. Just... You got to do a poll. Do you guys like chorizo or bacon? Ah! 
Turning, chorizo, fire, hot. This shirt needs to last at least four days. I only have four shirts. You need to tell me, why are you here? And I don't mean that in a mean way because you're my arch nemesis. Like, really, why would you want to cross the Pacific Ocean I knew on a boat <laughs> for three weeks? I would have had second thoughts. Tell me, Katie. It's the adventure of a life. No, no, no. Okay, sorry, Dave. Don't give me sorry. the, like, inspirational YouTube answers. I need real answers. And I need to do it right now when she's busy trying to deal with this, like, splashing oil so she can't think of, like, a fake answer. She has to give yeah. me the real one. The real answer? Real answer. Okay. Why? So, um, <laughs> so I quit my job in September and I had been working for the same company for seven years. So it was a big life change. I was traveling around Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia. Thailand. Thailand, Cambodia, Laos. I went to Sri Lanka. All right. I think Are you sure good. it's done? There's worms in pork, you know? If we get sick out here, we're you understand how f***ed we are? Yes, this is why I don't want to be the lead chef. Okay. So you're traveling Southeast Asia and you're living the dream. I was so free, absolutely having the time of my life. You know, money runs out eventually. It does. As you would expect. So I went back to Singapore where I had been living and working previously. And I was dog sitting for one of my best friends. I was catching up with Colleen, who um, I've known for over 13 years. Colleen, you guys are gonna meet Colleen. She's down there. So we're catching up. I'm doing this, you're was, doing that. Yeah, but she was joining Parlay to cross the Pacific Ocean. Meanwhile, I was figuring out whether I needed to go home to find another job and basically start over. What she was doing sounded way more Oh my awesome. gosh, what are you looking for? What do you want out of life? No, Tell I'm me the telling you, that's dark. the truth though. No, no, that's no, no, how no. It I know happened. it's the truth. So I got talking to her, obviously hearing way more about Parlay and, and Parlay is cool. following the YouTube channel and seeing how inspirational they all are. I asked her how I could get involved. And you thought being trapped on a tiny little boat for three weeks with eight people would be... I thought it would be longer. I thought it would be minimum a month. Stop cooking a fucking sandwich, I'll be on the sword. I know, Dave. <laughs> Jamie here is the food <laughs> We're going to talk to Jamie in a bit, okay? Yes, you're not allowed to say that on YouTube. Are we allowed to say food <laughs> Seinfeld says soup <laughs> Can I have a David She Sales hat? Yes, you can. We're supposed to do our workout today. We committed to losing 8 pounds no, no, and 15 pounds yeah. each. We have not worked out yet, and it's been 7 days. Should we cut out the cheese today, or you still want cheese? Why would you cut out cheese? Oh, okay. That's something my arch nemesis would say. <laughs> Katie is one super down to earth girl and I'd be lying if I said I didn't miss my arch nemesis. She did eventually figure out her life plans and decided to stay aboard Parlay long term. All right, one on the right is yours. What do you need to know now? Everything. I need to know everything, Jamie. What is that? What are you doing, dude? Sitting here. Jamie has been on Parlay for the longest. He is the most permanent of the permanent crew. And he joined when it was like six months. Six months after this boat was floating. How'd you find Parlay? What was the deal? On a website on Facebook. You must be putting the main up. We already finished the sandwich. We haven't even started the interview. All right, there you go. I'd rather have yours. <laughs> So you joined Parlay like five years ago. They've been sailing for three months. What were you thinking when you came aboard? That Colin was an engineer to get me a job on a super yacht. <laughs> <laughs> You've been around the longest. Everyone has come and gone. Most people stay for a few weeks, a few months. Jamie's been here for five years. Yeah, but what? I've been on and off like in that five years. Each year you normally go for three or four months. To go home? Home, wherever. Probably New Zealand, I'll go home. You're there, you know. How long have you been listening to Colin talk about crossing the Pacific? since the day I stepped on. Really? Yeah, yeah, the boat was going to Guatemala, so I got to Martinique. The boat's destination was Guatemala for hurricane season that year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I left in October and they're heading to Guatemala to haul out and rebuild the boat because it was only patched at the time. And I said, well, I'll come and help you rebuild the boat. And then after Guatemala, I was always coming back down to Panama across the Pacific. One thing was that it wasn't on the books to go to Mexico the way we did but it was just timing while we went to Mexico. So the original plan was to cross from Panama to French yeah, Polynesia. Yeah. So that's the only thing that changed, but, and yeah, timing, like we were meant to be crossing the Pacific two years ago. Yeah. But the coronavirus, bulkheads, like lucky, every, everything that happened was for a reason. Yeah, now we're doing it. It's kind of like everyday normal thing to you. It's not like for me, I'm crossing the Pacific Ocean. No, that's a load of shit because I've never crossed the Pacific Ocean. I know, but it act, you act like this is normal. I mean, I feel like I feel like this is no I, different it, than like a normal day on Parlay for you. It doesn't feel for real. Like, I, I don't know, at the end of it, it might feel more real. Like, it just feels like we're on a passage, you know, but. A really long passage. 
one thing it's like I love the sailing side of it long passage it's going to be interesting to see how we all feel at the end of it but to me it's more des destination like French Polynesia is going to be incredible so what do you want to do with your life sail around the world live the dream <laughs> what's the dream this my dream keeps on changing I thought my dream was just buy a boat and then that's the dream but then now I have to fix it so then I had to learn to love a new dream fixing the boat yeah so how has your dream changed as you've been on parlay for five years and actually started cruising, eventually captaining a boat? He captained an 82-footer. I don't know. I guess it's, it's I've started finding my feet a little bit to which way you want to go. Before I was on parlay, it was just step by step. Where do you see yourself in five years? He's making me ask, like, interview questions, you know, like when you go in for a job interview. Five years from today, it'd be 2028. 20, you'll be 47 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, how old would I be? <laughs> how old are you now? 41. Oh. You're 41? No. You're 36? Yeah. Oh, shit. No, 37. 37? Damn, dude. I'm a lot older than him. Can't tell by my dashing good looks. So where do you see yourself when you're 42? What are you doing? Hopefully circle navigated the world. Working on a boat. Sailing boat. I don't know. Panama. I love Panama. He saw me several times. Out of all the places that they've been, Panama is his favorite. Why do you like Panama so much? It has everything. Go to San Blas Islands. has like all white sandy beaches, coconut trees, but fishing's really good. Go to Bacchus. It's got surfing, partying. A lot of partying. <laughs> <laughs> we anchored right in the middle of Party Central. Clubs on this side, 100 feet that way, clubs on that side, all night long just banging music. I slept pretty good though. <laughs> Didn't hear a thing. <laughs> so what has been your favorite moment on Parlay? What, now? No, just all of it. Got on in Martinique, right? Yeah. So since Martinique to now, what has been your uh, favorite time? That's a hard one. It's okay, we have time. We have another two weeks. We'll be sitting at sea. <laughs> Oh, there's so many. It's all different. There's different moments mean different things. One place you go surfing, one place you go diving. One, every like French Polynesia is meant to have it all. So the yard time, the seven months they spent in Guatemala fixing the boat. Oh, don't get me wrong. The yard times have always been fun. Like Linton Bay, Guatemala, we always have fun wherever we go. I haven't spoke much about Belize. Belize is a really cool spot. We had a lot of fun in Belize. Hmm. For sure. Like in Honduras, Roatan and Utila, like it's all good places. But even like down... Uh, Which place had the coolest in. people? You know, Linton had that super unique community of like liveaboards, young people, old people, people running from the law. What was it like in Belize and Guatemala? Well, we were only cruising in Belize. Like Guatemala was more or less the same as Linton Bay. Oh, it is? Yeah. Okay. Linton Bay and Rio Dulce is the same thing. Because you got Rio, then you come straight out into Belize. So it's like you come straight out of the Rio Dulce into yeah. Paradise. And then in Linton Bay, you go straight to San Blast Islands or Bacchus del Toro, which is the same. So they're kind of similar. Do you like it better when the boat is like cruising from port to port to port? Or where you guys stay in one place for like three, four weeks? Port to port to port's better. Oh, you like it just constantly moving? Yeah, yeah. The Tinder is better, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I haven't updated to premium yet. <laughs> So Jamie is crushing it on Instagram. If you haven't seen him on Instagram, go look at him. He just had a reel go viral. Yeah, but when they're watching this footage, Dave, it's going to be in fucking 2030. <laughs> I'm timing this footage to come out exactly when Parlay releases their footage. So it's not going to be that long. First mate, Jamie Vandenbalk. John is his middle name. <laughs> Jamie's a legend. Colin actually named the boat after him. After they extended the sugar scoops a foot and a half, he changed it from Lagoon 450 to the Jamie 465. What are you doing? Well, I was editing. She was editing until I pulled her away from the editing. Brittany is the... Editor? They say here videographer. She's the one that edits and puts these episodes together for like, what, the past year now? It's been over a year. And that's why people still don't know who Brittany is on the channel. Sometimes they confuse her with Colleen over there. Even though Colleen does not look anything like Brittany. We're sisters from a different mister, okay? Brittany's always behind the camera. She's always filming and editing. That's okay. But now, because you're watching this and you guys are going to get to know the real Brittany and why Brittany decided to get on a boat with eight people for three weeks. I think of it as being placed on an amazing floating home with the coolest people you could possibly meet. Doing something not many people get to do. It's really a privilege. We're, in the, middle, so we're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We are 850 miles away from land right now. So how did you end up on Parlay? Long story short, really cool how I made it on Parlay. I was kind of in a midlife crisis with my job. I used to work in radio back home in broadcasting. 
I left my job there wanting to work on a boat. So I went to Mexico, took a bunch of different courses, got all the way up to like bear boat charter. Yeah. And then I said, okay, I'm going to do some hours and maybe I want to get into yachting. Maybe I want to get into being a delivery captain. And that's when I joined a boat. It didn't work out. Thank God it didn't work out. He was crazy, right? It was crazy captain. We were destined to go to French Polynesia. Same trail we're doing right now, over a year ago. And I met Colin Parlay and you as well, Dave. So I saw her roll up to the dock next to us right after we had crossed the Panama Canal. And I still remember there was like two girls, two guys, a weird looking captain guy on this monohull. And then boom, we're like, who's that girl? We were dock neighbors. Yeah, we were. But we didn't really meet at that point. No, not you really. Know? It wasn't until Playa the Now. I had long gone already. I went back to home to real life. And then Parlay continued going up the coast of Panama. And we serendipitously met in Playa the Now. Um, we had already cleared out of the country. We were going to cross. And then we had a cracked uh, exhaust elbow, engine problems. And it prevented us from crossing. And the moment I decided to leave my boat yeah. after some things that went down with the captain weren't that great, I yeah. had lost my confidence. And my other crew member, he told me that morning, hey, I'm thinking about leaving the boat. And I said, you know what, Blake? I support you. I'm with you. I'm, I'm actually going to leave too. And I was going to text Parlay. I remember going down to send a message. Uh -huh. And then I paused. And I didn't send that message. And I came back up to the cockpit and guess who was rolling in the Anchorage in Plyvenau at the exact same time. It this was boat. Parlay. That's crazy. And so things happened for a reason. It couldn't have been more perfect timing than that. The next day after the party, I reached out to Colin. We had a little interview and then he said, why don't you come on the boat next week for a trial? And a week turned into a year pretty quickly. So it's been it's over like a year now. Just over a year, like just 54 year. weeks. I just March 15 is my anniversary date oh my on this boat. So my job in radio was great. I used to work for the Canadian Broadcast Corporation. And that afforded me the opportunity to be able to go and work for as long as I would like to for them. So I would do half a year working in radio. The other half, I would take off and do a sabbatical. Um, I would work on projects around the world. She hiked all the way to base camp of Mount Everest, which is one of my dreams to do. I worked at the largest tribal gathering in Panama, in the jungle. Really? Two years. Okay. Uh, Didn't you live in a van or a bus or something too? Yeah, I toured with a band uh, in a bus, a mobile artist community. And we toured on a school bus that ran on vegetable oil. We did that for two years. Did it Panama smell really one year, good? Colombia the next year. Huh? Uh, did it smell really good? Like french fries. All the time. Yeah. I like french fries. Yeah, they're called like the Soul Fire Project. You go check them out great music so now you don't take like six months off anymore and then work and then go play well now i'm able to find a job and a life that combines those things i don't need a vacation from my life i don't need an excuse to take time off like the whole goal in life is to find something you love and marry all the things that you love together you know That's That's to not need to a vacation from your your other life so what do you want to be when you grow up i am grown up are you grown up <laughs> do you ever feel grown up do you feel grown up? Yeah, I'm doing it. It's pretty amazing. I don't feel grown up yet. I still feel like a kid. Like when I used to look at a 40 year old guy, I'd be like, God, he's so old. I know. You right? know when you were like 10 and your parents' friends would like introduce themselves, themselves mm -hmm. and they yeah, were 40 yeah. and you'd yeah, think that was so old. Yeah, exactly. That's how I felt. But then now I feel like I did as a, like probably somewhere between teenager and 30. Mm -hmm. I just like froze in time. Do you feel like all adults still feel like kids, but they just act like adults because they feel like they have to? When you're young, you think like everyone has to have their Pardon my French. They're shit together mm. by a certain age, and you have to be a certain thing by a certain age. You grow older, and you realize everyone's just still trying to figure it out. And yeah. we are we are still kids in big people's bodies. Yeah, nobody figures it out. Do you ever figure things out? Like, is there ever a moment in time where you're like, no, I know everything, I understand it, and I'm like in the exact place that I feel like I should be? Or is the whole point to always be trying to get to some other place? It's a journey. Not the destination. Nah. Peace Aerosmith. be the journey. Cool runnings. <laughs> Peace be the Peace journey. Be the yeah. journey. Yeah. Cool running. Now kiss the lucky egg. Brit is one of the elusive few who's actually found the ultimate work-life balance. Where her job is her vacation. Still washing clothes. Always at work, but probably never feels like she's working. And still like Corey shit. Always calling me out. That Jamie. Cool. Vinny has been my watch partner for these past, how many watches do you think we've done? We've done probably 18. So we do two hour watches every six hours. There's eight of us. This is the four to 220. six. 220. We are now in the two to four watch. We go off for six hours, eat dinner, sleep a little bit, and then we'll come back for the- 10 to 12. Exactly. And then 10 to 12, ideally we fall right asleep, but <laughs> Sometimes it takes a couple hours. So then we only get four hours of sleep before we have to wake up for our six to eight, which that's like the best one. Man. Yeah. Anyways, how'd you end up here, dude? Good question. <laughs> I'm still how did, you, 
How did I wind up in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? To me, it's not something a normal person would do. Yeah. Is it? I don't think so. <laughs> I'm starting to wonder if I'm as normal as I thought I was. You and I met in Panama. Yeah. And that was my initial introduction to Parlay and Colin and all you guys. Um, and that was because I was lucky enough to be drawn from his Patreons to go through the canal. Oh, that was sweet, man. Unbelievable. So fun. That's like the best bang for the excitement buck yeah. for being on a boat. Yeah. This is epic. Yeah. This takes a month versus that takes two days. Exactly. You know, we all became friends. I stayed in touch. We all knew this was ultimately what he was leading up to It's do. been his goal, man, for like his goal. years. And the last time I saw him in L.A., I kind of just jokingly said, man, even though I've never even sailed, <laughs> I'd be interested in sailing across the Pacific. And so... He put out his Patreon message to say, hey, we're going to pick a Patreon to go across the Pacific. I just texted him and he goes, are you serious? I thought you were joking. And he goes, you have a job. <laughs> <laughs> How could you even think about going? I go, well, I don't know. But if I have the opportunity, I can certainly find a you. way. And of course, I've got a girlfriend and two boys and obligations and stuff. It's tough, man. That's no, been the yeah. hardest part for me. Right. Is being away from the family. I've been away before, you know, working in Panama on the boat, but so far away that I can't jump on a plane and get home in an emergency. Yeah. Like the car broke down the other day. Mary almost got stranded on the side of the road. I felt helpless. It was when we were passing Socorro. Yeah. And then it really got real because Colin had said that, that there's those islands that we'd reevaluate the rigging and we could turn back at that point because we're still not that far offshore. Was oh, that when it became real for you too? Yes. Totally. Oh, dude. Totally. Oh, my God. Yeah. Man. Because you could see Socorro, like, just barely make it out on the horizon. As we're heading past it, and as it disappeared, you're going, all right, well, there was our turning point. <laughs> it's committed. And when you look at the chart, you go, there ain't nothing else out here. So those things do start really going through your head. What if something happens to one of the kids? What if something happens to my parents? Mm. Or what if something happens to one of the other crew? We got eight people here. The odds that something might happen to Seriously. someone is real. You feel you know? very alone. Yeah. I feel like that's what gives gives you some of the adrenaline. Yeah. This constant feeling of excitement that all of this really, really matters. Yeah. Like everything is on the line right now. What if there was a little hole in the boat and what if something happened? We are relying on ourselves 100%. Totally. And that's just not a feeling that I've gotten to experience, really. Yeah, right. Such a higher level. Once you get out here and you realize the eight of us need to take care of each other and get each other through this because that's all we got. And it's cool seeing everybody kind of chip in where they can chip in. Vinny has chipped in making us the most epic breakfast sandwich starting three days ago, which he started a trend. Every day since then, we've been making these breakfast sandwiches. Now we can't live without them. I don't know if we have enough rations to make breakfast No, we don't. Sandwiches. As long as the food is still letting us make yeah, yeah. the sandwiches, we will be making the That's sandwiches. That's the bigger concern, is getting Jamie to lend us some <laughs> frozen meat. No, Jamie is the most giving person I know. It's just he's trying to save and ration the food so the fresh stuff is used up before it goes bad. Because we're going at the pace of a fast jog. So imagine running from the northern tip of Maine all the way down to San Diego or Tijuana at nine minute mile pace. That's why sailing takes a really long time. It's an interesting point with our speed is they're so used to it. Jamie and Colin and people that have been living on a boat, you're going nowhere fast, but we're coming from a different pace of life and from vehicles where you're speeding from one place to another. And going and, 60 miles an hour yeah. is like, oh, so slow, yeah, exactly. I need to go like 70. So to try to wrap your head around covering 3,000 miles at this pace is like, <laughs> makes you feel like you're never gonna get there. I wanna know, now that we are one week in, what are your expectations versus reality? And I just know from watching the, the channel, and knowing you guys and my experience in Panama, spending this much time with the crew, you really get to know somebody rather than small talk. Everyone on this boat is just amazing. As looking forward to the fishing, that hasn't disappointed. I reeled in a small tuna yesterday, a little skipjack tuna. Oh. But I got that Dorado the second day. Oh, dude, it was yeah. like massive. It was huge. I've caught several Dorado in the past and nothing even close to that. So that was like a trophy for me, but we had a lot of excitement today. We had two big fish because they broke braided line. Whoa, really? Yeah. Now that makes sense, like thousands of miles out. Yeah. 
You're yeah, you're getting big... bigger fish. Probably a billfish. I just hope we have big enough tackle if we're hooking big billfish out here and going six or seven knots. So that's probably one of my highs. It's what comes from it, right? Like the sushi, I probably ate like two pounds of tuna sushi, sashimi the past couple of days. That kind of stuff is just hard to put into words, how cool it is. Yeah, right. What about some of the things you didn't think of that, that have made this hard? If you haven't done it, you can only watch so many videos read so many articles. I think that what you're not prepared for is basically being up 24 hours a day. Even though we're getting our naps in between shifts, mm. you know, at home, I feel like I get a good chance to reset every day, every night, get a good night's sleep, tackle the next day. Here, it's kind of like continuous time. Like you get a nap, but you're not really resetting. It was game on from day one. It's like your first two hour shifts on, and you're not stopping your rotation and shifts until this thing's over. For and three I, weeks, it's not like you go, I need a couple days break from the two hour shifts. I need some solid sleep. It's like, yeah. no, you're in this. Or even just one day, like this morning, I was definitely thinking at six o'clock, I'm like, I think Vinny can just do it on his own. Like, does he really need me? But you can't do that. Yeah. Everybody on this boat is depending on you. I guess I just still couldn't wrap my head around how much time I would have to kind of reflect on how far from the coast we are, how much farther we have to go, how far I am away from my family, Mm -hmm. um, what what could happen while I'm gone, those yeah. things. It's a daily challenge to tamper those feelings down, convince yourself that everything's going to be okay, yeah. live in the moment, have fun here, and enjoy the people you're, you're with. You're forced to. Yeah. You feel that? Yeah. Like you're forced to in so many different yeah. ways to be in the moment. The challenges, yeah. they're never ending, right? And at some point, I would say it happened probably two days ago, I accepted my fate. And isn't that like one of the stages of grief? It's like you get angry, you deny, and then eventually you get to acceptance. I have reached acceptance on the thing that has been hard for me, which is everything is so wet at night. Like for me, the way I reset, it's comfort. I can get five hours of sleep, but I need to be so comfortable for those two hours where I'm falling asleep. And the hour that I'm falling asleep on this boat, everything starts getting wet. Condensation, all of the cushions inside the salon, which is where I'm sleeping, become wet and I'm laying on it. So my legs are wet. Yeah. I was trying to overcome it until a few days ago when I was like, this is my fate. And I yeah. started embracing it and it somehow became easier to deal with. And you're better off for it. Uh -huh. I realize now that this is the routine for three weeks. I'm going to accept it because you have no choice. We're going to go this speed. <laughs> we will get there eventually, but I, I cannot make this boat go faster. It is what it is. And that's what we signed up for. But for it some is. reason, even though you, you knew I that's knew. what you were signing up I knew up we're for, going six miles an hour. Right? Yeah. It becomes a different thing when you're in it. I agree. A day or two ago, I feel like it, it changed. We're so comfortable on this boat in reality with That's true. Shot, plenty of fresh water. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have but tons so of power. It's, it's not like we're feeling dirty. We just did laundry, so we have clean clothes. We got good food. I mean, it could really, First world problems. It could be really uncomfortable. First world problems. And, they, and that's what I'm trying to focus on is, man, how lucky am I to cross the Pacific like this than the way many, many, many people have done it where there's no way it was fun. And this is. And uh, every evening, we have those sundowners, which for those 20 minutes, it's like you're in a different world. I, I don't know how to describe it. It's it a does really, something inside yeah, you, right? Yeah. You feel it? Yeah, I think it's really important for morale and for the crew. It's something triggering in the brain that that's definitely something I look forward to every day. It's the best part of my day. I agree. Just a year ago, Vinny was watching these videos on his couch, and now he's crossing the Pacific with us. To be honest, I never would have imagined I'd be here myself, but life has a way of giving you opportunities you didn't know you needed. I have to look up my phone. She went and put a story up and got votes. Cheers. Baby club sodas. Let's see. Oh, there we go. That's the workout. Who's working out the hardest? The boat goes too. Oh my God, me too. Yeah. Hell yeah. I was just filming it, so I was working out extra hard for the video that you just saw. Thank you. He stopped working out after the video stopped. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> so Colleen, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a captain. Really? I do. So Colleen, works on super yachts. How'd you get into super yachting? I started just watching sailing channels like Delos in college. Yeah. And it, it just happened to stumble upon it. I went on a road trip with my friend. His uncle worked for a sailing company. Mm -hmm. He asked us like, hey guys, I need help with the delivery. Oh, so, so you started just accidentally crewing yeah. for somebody. Yeah, I didn't know about yachting or anything. It's kind of unknown in America. It is. Well, now since Below Deck is out, it's yeah. more known, but yeah. 
Yeah, nobody knew about it then. We did the delivery. It was like four days. It was yeah. the worst sailboat I've ever Where been Where was it from ever. and to? Port Lauderdale to Charleston. So it was my first sail ever. And the sail ripped in half. There was a diesel leak through the whole boat. Like you couldn't breathe. Oh my God. I had to like lift myself out of the hatch to like breathe during the night. Like, <gasps> So it was a horrible passage, but yeah. you still fell in love with sailing. Yeah. His uncle told me about yachting and how to get into it. Yeah. But I always knew that I wanted to be on sail. It's like my heart is with sailing. You knew that? Yeah. Like even then? Even when I'm working on yachts, I see a sailboat go by. I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to work on sailboats. I just want it to be my home. So oh, really? I want to get my own boat and maybe eventually cross the Pacific by myself or like, wait, with a crew. Single hand? Maybe. Really? I couldn't imagine doing that. I can barely do it with eight people. I think it's so cool being able to be by yourself for that long and scary, but... It is. Okay, so how did you end up in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with these eight <laughs> kind of random people? Yeah. Right? There's random. nobody on this boat that is alike. So my first yacht that I worked on, I uh, became really good friends with the chief engineer. One day we were on the sun deck. I remember this moment. It was during charter and we were looking at this catamaran go by and I was uh -huh. like, Oh, I love sailboats. So I just want to be on that. And he was like, really? Like, you like sailing? He told me about his friend who bought a hurricane damaged sailboat uh -huh. and has been fixing it up to sail around and travel the world with his friends. And I was like, whoa, that sounds so cool. That was Colin. So they, they used to work together. Okay. And they're pretty good friends. Colin put out a Facebook post about mm -hmm. crewing on the Pacific Passage. I think this was like three years ago before COVID. Oh, so you were talking to him way before you came to Winton Bay. Yeah, yeah. I was supposed to go on the crossing with them before, like that. originally. So you were supposed to have done this two three and a half now. years ago. Yeah, I met them in Linton Bay the one time. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to come meet them. Oh, just like hang out. Yeah. Okay. I remember when she came. I still remember. I was right next door, fixing my bulkheads, completely lost. I've done a lot of different things with Colleen on Parlay. Met her in Linton Bay. We sailed a little bit around there. We went to Bocas together, and then we crossed the Panama Canal together. And then you continued on with them up north through Panama? Yeah, we went to Playa Vanau. Okay, and, and that's then, when she came aboard, right? Yeah, that's when okay. we came. So then I went to work on a super yacht in Italy, and that was really fun. We went 11 countries. The guests were really nice. They stayed on for four months, which was like oh, really geez. hard. Is it like better when they stay aboard so then you can get to know them? And... No, I wouldn't say like it's better. It's just hard because you're working like non-stop for four months, oh, like 12 hour, at least 12 hour shifts. Do the tips get better if it's the same people over a longer period? There was no tips because it was private. We weren't working for charters. It was just like the owners of the boat. Oh. Sometimes they tip, but it's rare because like you're just working for the owners. But charter boats, like that's when you get the tips. Oh, I see. And what position were you? at that point i was the bosun what is that you run the deck it was a new build so we had to set up the deck oh like the first time yeah so like order inventory we do like mooring okay operations maintenance stuff like that okay and then after that what'd you do that's when i left that boat and just went to school i'm studying to be an officer so i was in school from like september to before i came here to like yeah. february okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I was just studying, learning about navigation, celestial navigation, stability. All the classes being an officer, what do you get to become? It's called officer of watch. So you can stand a watch in the bridge. So just like we do on here. Yeah. We do like two hour shifts on here. Okay. So when the captain's sleeping, like I would be in charge of navigating the ship and mm. watching out for other boats. Okay. Um, passage plans, like safety on board. So you're like a step below the captain? Sometimes there's several officers. So okay. it could be like third, second officer, first officer. And then Depends on the size of the boat. Yes. Yeah. You're probably one of the most experienced um, on like coming on this passage. Not particularly because okay. sailboats and motorboats are completely different. Like passage plans, how to get from A to B. Yeah. There's so much more that goes into it on a sailboat than a motorboat. So okay. I'm very beginner at sailing, I would say. I still think it's kind of crazy that we all volunteered to come sit on a boat. <laughs> uh, 45 by 25 foot area for three to four weeks with eight people. We're just doing this. This is what we do all day long. We see this and then we do that right there three times a day for two hours. And then we just look ahead at the sail. We look up at the sail. We look down at the water and we're like, yeah, looks good. Why are you doing this? Your friends know. must ask you like, what's wrong with you? I think it's a feeling. I got this feeling the first time I went sailing. You know, you love it. I've never felt this feeling before. 
really? other than like being on the water and sailing. It's like warm and cuddly feeling. <laughs> really? No, no, no. Well, I get yeah, it. I get it. it. I feel that during sundown. It just feels right. It's just being out in the water, feeling free, feeling like you're doing something big. I feel that. I feel all that too. But I guess maybe I'm the weird one, but I feel a lot of the difficulty of like not being able to do all the stuff that I want to do, like this moment. Like earlier, I wish I could go for a run. Last night, I really wish I could like hang out with my kids. How do you deal with that? I just feel like I try to keep busy. Audiobooks are a huge one for me. Catching up on like mindfulness, for sure. What is that? Um, when you have you this mean? time. Uh, just like being in touch with yourself and like things you need to work on. I've been thinking a lot about that this past year. Really? Just, like, I know my biggest problem is that I'm never in the moment. I'm always about the destination, less about the journey. I'm always thinking about the future, like what I need to do to, to fix whatever issue. I know you're supposed to be in the moment. I suck at that. How do you be in the moment more? I guess meditation. The audiobooks really actually help me a lot. Like motivational talks and stuff like that. Oh, okay. They kind of put things into perspective. These little things aren't important, like you're worried about. What has been some stuff that you did not expect? on this passage. I didn't expect to see a manta ray in the water. Oh, like you saw two, manta. right? Yeah, oh, that, that was, was epic. so cool. It was the coolest thing ever. How long are you gonna stay aboard when we get to French Polynesia? I'm definitely gonna stay for a couple weeks. After that, I have to take my exam when I go back and study. To be the officer? Yeah, Okay. study a lot, a lot. I have to make a trip to Europe. To see her Oh my god, if you put that on, I'm gonna kill you. Don't worry, I'll edit all that out. Everything is edited and cut perfectly. Do you think I actually talk the way I talk in the videos? Uh, Everything yeah. is cut perfectly, so when people, when you see the video, it's like, oh man, he's so eloquent. No, I'm not eloquent. I cut this sentence with that sentence. Well, I definitely need the edits. All right, so we're rolling up this massive sail that is making all that noise. There, it's gone. I think we're gonna roll out the jib now. Colleen was clearly born to sail. Yeah! and I'm certain she'll end up on her own boat one day. Talking to her throughout this passage really did help me be more in the moment. <laughs> this is Stephen McCloud from the Clan McCloud. Like the Highlander. Highlander. Did y'all ever watch the Highlander? There can only be one. There can be only one. They cut their heads off. Unless you take his head. Get all the power. And with it is power. This is Stephen, he's one of those guys. Sundowner, baby. Okay, Stephen McCloud from the Clan McCloud. I feel like you're on this boat. I am on this boat. How did you end up on this boat? <laughs> Colin picked me. I said that I'd like to do it. Tried to make a half-assed video one morning. Did you make it? Kind of. My video skills are non-existent, so I didn't realize in a WhatsApp video after 30 seconds it stops. I didn't stop, so I don't know what Colin ever saw or didn't <laughs> see. But... Steven is the original patron that got chosen to come on this passage. That's why he is AKA the chosen one. I don't know if yep. you guys know, Steven did a we, passage with me last year. How do you keep on getting on passages with YouTube channels? That's what I've, I want to know. I have no idea. Well, a lot of it is you, your recommendation. That's true, I did. Yep. He came highly recommended by me. Yeah. yeah, I didn't expect to be chosen. I'm older than the rest of the crew. So grateful that I was. This is an absolute blast, and it's probably the only time I'll get a chance to do it. To cross the Pacific, huh? Yep. What did you expect from this trip? It's so far exactly what I expected. It about is. this trip, yeah. I mean, we had some issues, you know, unexpected issues before we left. Yeah. So we had a month in Puerto Vallarta. So you came down and then ended up staying for four weeks longer Correct. than expected. Came a week early anyway. Okay. Thinking it would be a week to 10 days early. We had some other little things to fix. It was great. It was hot. Very, very hot. I crashed with Steven in his hotel room for that last week. It was very nice. There was a bathtub. I took a bath in the morning. I took a bath at night. <laughs> I didn't know there was a bathtub in the room. There's two bathrooms in the room. So David told everybody took a bath last night and i like david the the bathtub's only that high it's a shower still. <laughs> oh there was apparently there is i checked it yeah there is i one. was there for like five uh, days yeah something like that and i must have taken like 15 baths people take a morning shower i took a morning bath because i knew once you're on the boat there's no more showering without feeling guilty your morning or my morning oh do we have different mornings <laughs> <laughs> well, I got up around daylight, and you got up somewhat later than that. I got up a little later. Okay, yep. so Stephen, what did you do before? I'm retired. 
basically. Okay. I had bought a Fountain Peugeot Seona 47. Okay. Didn't work out for various reasons. Okay, this is something I've always wanted to ask. Super long story short, he bought a Fountain Peugeot, beautiful Seona. We stayed aboard one night with the family, AC throughout, lithium batteries, solar panels, like ready to cruise. And then he came down to Panama and did a passage with me to come back to Texas. And it was a very rough passage, at least for like- First three days were rough. Yeah, so half of it was like yeah. crazy. When the waves come straight at you you ride up on the waves and you smash down and then you come up and you smash down and his cabin was up front same cabin i'm in now well i was airborne you know at the tops of the waves i kept going up and i did that for three days so <laughs> it was fun though so i want to know how much that played a role in you selling your boat because i've always secretly felt a little guilty zero Oh, zero. No, zero. So I don't I got, have to feel guilty. I got caught up in Houston, and, oh. and I spent seven days too long in the United States that year. Yeah. It just became easier to sell the boat because I couldn't get to it. Sure. Okay, so what was that? Okay. So the idea was to sell it and start again later. Steven left us in Mexico, flew back through Texas to Canada, but in Houston, which is my hometown, they were quite strict on him. They put me in an immigration detention center for 20 hours, and sitting up in a chair, even though I spent well in excess of a million dollars, paid all the taxes yeah, yeah. on it. Yeah, more than a million on yeah. the boat. He has a house there, a car there. He has another boat on the Gulf Coast of Florida. None of that played a role at all. They were just like, you overstayed they for seven didn't days. Care. I'm banned for five years. I can appeal it, and I've been told that I'll win the appeal, but after the treatment, there's not enough money on this planet to ever make me He's cross a man of principle. Again. Tell me about the treatment. Not as much for me, but the other people in the room, the, like you weren't an Asian person, you were a yellow monkey. Well, that's what they That's, that's the way they, these, the border guards talk. Like, oh my God. Man. I was very polite for the first six hours. Yeah. They'd already banned me from the US. After six hours, they called me. He gets another guy. He's unlocking a door to the room and he's putting rubber gloves on. And I said, no, no. This isn't happening. Like, when the I had enough at that point. Yeah, well, I said, you're not doing a cavity search. Okay. What did he say? He said, we can do whatever we want. And I said, maybe, but it's going to be a healthcare professional. Not, and I won't use the exact words, I, but the last part of the words were hillbilly redneck. <laughs> and it kind of went downhill after that, but I'd already been you barred from the... I, I was done. And they didn't do their search, so... Steve is a patient man, so for him to, to be, point. be that upset, it, it says something. You are very well off. No, I'm... You live a life that's very comfortable. Comfortable. Yeah. Right. You have pretty much everything you want and everything you need for sure. Yeah. So coming on a boat and being restricted in so many different ways, how does that affect you? It doesn't affect me at all. Like, I, I love this. I was I was planning on doing this on my own boat. So, I mean, it was new, my boat was newer, had more amenities, but that's yeah. not a big deal. I spent a lot of time in a hunting camp, or used to, you know. Oh, I see. There's, I see. So there's no, I don't need amenities. This is fun, you know. Uh, yeah. And I never thought I'd get to do it. And I'm so thankful to Colin and the crew for letting me do this. You want some vodka in that? No, I'm, I'm off of the beers. Okay, so where do you see your boating life going from here? I will probably buy another catamaran. You think it'll be a power one? Possibly. The problem is with my wife and I, this is more my thing than hers. She's never going to cross an ocean. I can be quite happy just spending the rest of my sailing time in the Caribbean. Okay. You know, going back and forth from Bahamas to Grenada. Go to yeah. Grenada for hurricane season haul the boat, start again. With just Diane and I on the boat, having things like uh, spinnakers and down furling Jenniker on my boat, probably too much for just two people, okay. inexperienced people especially. Um, so do you actually like more of the sailing or is it more of being on the water? For me, being on the water. Me too. I mean, I've been a power boater my whole life. During COVID, somehow got into sailing channels. Like, okay. it, it intrigued me because the one thing that these can do is that they can cross an ocean or go long distance where a power boat's restricted by how much fuel it can carry. Now so, you can buy a powerboat that'll cross any ocean you want, but that's not in my budget. Like, what would that cost and what kind of boat are we talking about? We're talking mega yachts of 50 million up probably. Out oh of really? Them. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could get a trawler. And go super slow. But power cats are nice too. You know, they're just ugly. Aesthetically, I like the look of a sailing oh, cat. Really? Better than a power. They're kind of boxy, but they have full size household refrigerators in them, all kinds of AC generating power. And I'm 62, so I don't necessarily want to be going up in a boson chair to untangle something that <laughs> like Colin was doing. Yeah. Let's say you get that power cat. Are you going to live aboard? Or? I would live aboard for at least six months a year. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. you'll still keep a house. Uh, oh, yeah. And go back and forth. Yeah. You know, I've got grandkids. Uh, and okay. I would say six months uninterrupted in the Caribbean uh -huh. and then maybe fly back and forth okay. for a couple of weeks at a time. That's kind of the dream for most people that are planning on retiring soon. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people probably love the idea of sailing around the world too, but you've got to be in the right place at the right time. In my situation, knowing that I probably never 
would have done this. Now I've got the opportunity to go at least one good leg, a long leg. It's the yeah. longest leg. It's the longest leg, yeah. I think it's... the Indian would be the tougher ocean, though. Oh, is it? I think so. Okay, but, but it's shorter. It's a little shorter, yeah. So we get longest passage, we get the longest passage. of the yeah. world. Yeah. Steve is one of our first Patreons, and he is the ultimate crew. I think the most unique thing about Parlay, everybody is so different, but we're all tied together by this, this boat. Tomorrow we'll make a video about starting a fire with the world's brightest flashlight. Okay. Flashlights? Mm. Subscribe to Dave so you can watch him cross the ocean. I'm going to sleep. Good night, guys.